I'm in Toronto today visiting with one of the photographers that I never thought I'd get a chance to do this with. And I'm with Ed Pertinsky, and uh, we're at his studio, which is not really a studio as many of you would think. There's no lights, there's no backgrounds. This is a working environment, and if you know Ed's work, you would know that this is the ideal place to work on it. And Ed, I want to first off say thank you for allowing me to spend the day with you and uh, to share your story with us and our readers um, about your photography, which I find to be one of the most amazing things. Now, luminous landscape is about the landscape, but you know, you've done something different. You're not about the Yosemite Valley landscape. You're about the landscape that man has had an effect on. So maybe you'd like tell us where this all began and how it all started and you know, why you focused your career on this aspect of uh, the landscape. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually, uh, I did first fall in love with nature and the landscape, and I don't think I would have ever managed to get to the work that I do without that uh, first love of, of being out there, of, of being in the forest or canoeing across pristine lakes in northern Ontario. Uh, so that was my youth growing up in, the, in those places. Every weekend I could get out there, I was there. And as I kind of thought of being a photographer, I did begin with taking pictures out there. But I was looking at it very differently. I was looking, I knew what the kind of quote-unquote genre of landscape photography was. Uh, I was very cognizant of not trying to make uh, cliches. So what I started thinking about was some of my favorite painters, like Jackson Pollock and the Abstract Expressionists. <laughs> So I started thinking, how can I take a large format camera, like a 4x5, get the best lenses possible, and go into that complex space in the forest, in the, in the bush, and be able to start working with it as raw material to treat it almost like a painting, like an all-overness and, and, and a very high complex weave of pattern that would culminate into an image that, that seemed to make sense. So I was entering what I feel are some of the most chaotic environments you can find, which is shrub and bush and trees and all of the mix that you find when you go for a walk through a forest, and somehow see into that chaos and find these moments where the positioning is very precise and using the 4x5 and using the perfect light and the time of the year and the colors at that, that time of year, all those things come together to find that field almost painting, that, that all overness and, and, and compression of space. So that's where I really began to learn about really seeing in complex environments and attenuating my eye to be able to kind of hive out those kinds of moments within a very chaotic landscape. And then I think after that, after doing that, I felt that it was my ability to do that, attenuate that, that played well deep into my future where all of a sudden I'd enter all kinds of different landscapes and be able to tune in to, to where the Im image might be within that space. So whether it was shipbreaking yards in Bangladesh or whether it was refineries or whether it was tire piles, it was still kind of going into space and being able to attenuate. But you had, a, you had a turning moment, didn't you? I mean, you, you had a, an epiphany somewhere along the line that all of a sudden there was something different that you could look at. You know, where, where did that start and how did it, you know, just begin to roll off into a different direction? So you started and you, you were watching the complexity of what nature had to offer, but something, something else hit you. You saw something different and, you know, it grew from there. Where, where was that? Well, actually point? it was, uh, if I recall, it was 1981 <clears throat> and I was driving around it was spring. I like I, I like leaves off the tree. I like the complexity of, of vines and brush and all that. And I was driving all through, you know, I was Roanoke, Pennsylvania, mostly the eastern seaboard of the United States. But I was coming back and I was pretty much just kind of looking for that kind of landscape. And then I ended up in Pennsylvania and kind of got in the wrong turn and I had to cut across countryside that I wasn't expecting and I ended up in this town called Frackville. Oh, Frackville. Frackville. <laughs> and I was in this town. All of a sudden, you know, I'm looking around and the whole landscape had been transformed. 
and I took out my 4x5, and instead of doing the pristine landscape in these kind of compressed, highly complex kind of compositions, I started looking at this mined landscape. And it was coal mining scene, and, 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 and there was one point where I stood on this hill, and I did a 360, and the whole landscape had been transformed around me. And I took a whole lot of pictures, maybe about 15 pictures, spent the afternoon there unexpectedly. And, and then I came back and I did all the processing and made all my contacts and I started printing the ones that I went to do, which were the more landscapey ones, so compressed landscapes. And all of a sudden, I kept going back to these series that I did in Pennsylvania. And all of a sudden I pulled one out and I enlarged it and I said, actually, this is more interesting. In a way, it's more, it's, <laughs> more, it's more interesting and it's more of my time. It felt more authentic. And, you know, as, a, 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 as an artist, I, I'm always searching for, you know, what do I, how do I speak about my time? How do I speak about what's important? And it felt that, you know, the other landscapes I was doing, as, as, as interesting as they were, they felt somehow yearning for something that had already passed. Whereas this had this urgency of the future. Uh, looking at the mining images, that this is, it's about the landscape that we usurp, the landscape that we take things from, that I felt was what, where the issues for humanity are going to eventually land on, because there's, we live in a finite planet, and there's only so much iron ore, there's only so much copper that we can easily access. Yes, there's more down in the crust of the earth, but what we can get at and what's viable is what's at the surface. So I started thinking about that and thinking, well, if I start a body of work on, on this, on not the, the landscapes that we serve, that eventually uh, 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 that that work in accumulation would start to tell a story. And I started to look at the largest examples of copper mining, the largest examples of iron ore mines, the largest examples of the building of a dam. So it was always that research that said, where is the largest expression of this thing that humans have engaged in? And those were the subjects of my pictures. And so 35 years later, I continue to make these pictures, and it continues to build on this singular idea of human systems engaged in the taking of things from nature and transforming them and transporting them back into our urban centers. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's funny you bring the word humanity into it, because number one, seeing all your images, a lot of these have had to touch you as a human, but a, a lot of your images bring awareness uh, to a wider audience about what humans have done to some of these regions and, and areas, and some of them are, are pretty drastic. You know, so you, how do you prioritize this and pick the, this? I mean, this, as you began to see what you wanted to do, you moved forward. And how did you find the, the places? You've gone to uh, the, the dam, the big dam in, in China. You've done uh, tire pits. You've done aerials of uh, where salt's collected. And you know, you've actually done one with water and, I believe, oil, too. And, mm -hmm. and one that I really love was where you actually started with quartz. Right. Uh, so how did you find a, a way to branch all these things out, pick the subjects, and, and, and develop these projects to completion? Or you know, were these concurrent or at the same yeah. time? You know? Well, I work concurrently. I, I have multiple projects. You know, that it's not just one thing. But usually what I like to have are compartments in which, uh, you know, which are, I, you can also call series, where, where I know that that image belongs to that series. And then I also allow myself the chance to say, I, this doesn't belong to anything, but I'll still take a picture of it because it's interesting. And those are the places where often the new, the new ideas uh, emerge from those okay. kinds of things. So I do trust my eye that if it's stopping me somewhere and it's saying, take a picture of this, I, I don't deny it that, um, even though I might be on another track. It started with mining. And then once I decided mining was it, then I said, okay, well, where's a great mine near Toronto? And one of the great mines, uh, mining areas is Sudbury, where um, they have the, the nickel mines. I found a way to meet the CEO of, of, of INCO, and I met with him directly, and he said, I like what you're doing. Um, yeah, sure, and he gave me access to it. And that was really important access, because that was one of the first times I got into a mine. So to do these places, to go into these places, you have to go, 
you know, past the barbed wire into the front office and get through the front office and then get somebody who takes you in a truck and drives you around the mine and keeps you safe from falling into a pit or whatever. So, so you can't, you can't, you can't run around and hide. And, and plus I've got four by five or then I uh, went to eight by 10 eventually. So, so this isn't something you can kind of sneak in and take a few pictures. I had to go through the front door. So that's always been part of my strategy is how do I get to the person who can make the decision and then I have to convince that person that, that they should let me in. A little in. bit of persistence along the way. Persistence, not, you know, not, you know, no is usually the first answer and then you work with the no and convert the no to a yes. And sometimes it could take a year, sometimes it's you know, within first meeting and sometimes I've taken several years to get the yes. So, so it just depends on, on, on the complexity and, and the management. With your work and, and looking at your body of work and as it's changed, at one point you switched from you know, working on the outside to looking at the immensity of the change in the landscape on interiors, factories, and uh, some of these kind of things. You know, what moved you indoors? And, and obviously you stayed with the same theme, you know, the impact on humanity, right. but you know, you, you went you went indoors and some of the things that you captured along those lines are just eye-opening for some of us that never see this. So how, where, how did you get to that point where you said there was another world under a roof? When I was 15, you know, my father passed away. My mother was an immigrant. She didn't really have any way to put me through school. So I had to put myself through school. So I always worked in, the, you know, in big industries. So I worked for Ford. I worked for GM. I worked in the biggest, one of the richest gold mines in Northern Ontario, underground in the gold mine. I worked uh -huh. in these places. Wow. So, uh, so I had seen them firsthand. And, and worked in them, you know, and if I looked at even just production lines, um, you know, I worked in a frame plant, which was a supplier to Ford. I worked at the Ford plant. I worked at a big GM plant, uh, an engine plant. So I worked in these places and got to see it, that world firsthand. And then I worked in mine. So in a way, I've gone back to something that I had firsthand experience with. Uh, to photograph. Um, and that's also why it kind of made sense mm -hmm. for me to go to those locations and, and, and to do that. And developing th this methodology uh, of, of how one, you know, goes from the idea of I, I want to do something through research and then expanding into that and finding those places and getting access. And so you are asking earlier about different themes and how do we get to it. So if you look at you know, the mining theme, I said, okay, I've done mining for quite some time. And then at, at around 1990, I was thinking, well, you know, when you remove stone a block at a time from a landscape, I thought there had to be this kind of interesting architectonic residual space that's left behind. Because when you mine, it's more blasting, random, and you got the ledge. So I then went and said, okay, through the imagination, I said, I've never seen dimensional stone quarries, but I'm going to research where they are. So I started researching, I went to the library, this is pre-web and pre-anything, I went to the reference library, I found kind of quarry magazines and stone quarry, you know, and found out, you know, and then I went to a trade show where it was, they were talking about stone and where are the big quarries for stone, asking them directly who are involved in the industry. Oh, there's these huge quarries in Vermont, okay, I'm going to Vermont. And then I went to Vermont and they said, oh, you should go to Prayer, Italy, there's amazing, and that was the first time I went uh, internationally to another, to another country to do, but it was really out of the imagination of saying there must be these places that I then did the research and then found the places and then found access into those places. So that working methodology just keeps repeating itself even to today. So I'll get an idea and say, okay, I want to do whatever, you know, a dam in, the biggest dam in the world. Well, that happened to be in China. Or if I want to do... You know, I'm cur currently interested in, in the, the whole movement towards lithium as a, a source of energy. Yeah, a power. And power. Yeah. So where's the biggest lithium mines in the world? So I'm, that's where I'm going in, in four days. So, yes. so, so it's, all, it's still the same kind of process of having an idea, but now it's global. I'll find the place in the world where that occurs, and then I'll put myself in that place with the conditions that I need, whether it's a helicopter or a fixed air airplane or if it's a drone or if just me working from the ground, I'll actually know all those things before I even arrive on that location. Now, you, you did a project uh, on oil. And mm -hmm. I found that to be a little bit different. 
obviously, you know, you, you, you went to your traditional way on oil, but you seem to have actually followed through with what the impact of oil is. You know, oil as it progresses, you know, through to eventually the automobile, the tire, the byproducts, and, you know, where it begins and what it ends up as on a much broader scale. Kind of like, okay, there's the oil, but the effects of all, the whole thing. You told a story, kind of a, a different storyline. How did you come up with, you know, that whole progression, you know, to move to all the elements that the oil affects, I suppose? Is I call it, I had my I call it oil epiphany, I think, <laughs> in 1996. I was going to Sudbury, back to Sudbury, to photograph the tailings. I hadn't done any mines for about eight years. I'd done other things. So I'm heading off, and I remember I pulled off, I filled my tank up with gas. My car was kind of burning oil at the time, so I had to put oil in, in, in there. And, and it was raining, and I kind of had this plasticky raincoat. And I pull out, and the blacktop was just laid on. And I kind of looked at everything, and I'm saying, everything around me is dependent on oil. And I never thought of it as a project, but I said, and then I thought about where I was going, and I'm thinking, well, those big, huge mines couldn't be at that scale without the mechanical advantage of all the machinery that we have in there that can move material on that level. And I realized that when I was photographing these mines and these tailings that were outside of everybody's purview, nor, no, no one really knows where oil really looks like, where it comes from, where that landscape is. And to me, oil was like this thing that almost like spilt blood. If you see spilt oil, it's a bad thing. You know, it's usually not, it doesn't, it's not a good omen, you know, when you see oil everywhere, yeah. blood, and so it seemed, but it was this, this black stuff coursing through these pipes across our nation and across through America and North, that keeps everything going, and, but yeah, we never see it, it's kind of like this thing we put in our, and I said, well, I want to peel back oil as an idea and start going to the landscape, so it starts with a source of oil, so I went to California where it was first discovered, and big gushers were discovered, and then went to the oil sands and, and, and continued, and then I looked at refineries. So I was looking at the process, and then I started thinking, well, what are the outcomes of oil? And I started looking at, well, all the plastics, and then you look at all the, um, the suburb and the automobile and the, and the lifestyle that we had, and all of these things were all derived as a result of, of this you know, inexpensive fuel that, that had this incredible built-in energy that, that can drive uh, a modern world. And then it occurred to me as well that it really is the internal combustion engine and the discovery of this abundant fuel, oil, brought together that has even allowed humanity to, to become 7.5 billion and growing. If we couldn't do agriculture at the scale we're doing it, if we couldn't move products to the cities at the scale we're doing it, without the engine and the fuel, we, would, we wouldn't be able to do that. So at a certain point, I understood oil as being one of the key factors to human expansion and the acceleration that we're that we're experiencing today. Yeah, I just found that's one of the most amazing stories to you know seeing how you you expanded that topic so so largely. I think it was amazing. You know, we could go on and on, and I have got so much I'd like to talk to you. Hopefully, we'll have more time. But um, I want to come back and uh, talk about equipment here in a minute because you know. Just like you were saying, the mines need tools and you know things to drive them so they can you know deliver product and do all that. You know you need a, a set of tools you know that you've used through the ages that allow you to capture the images that you have. So I want to you know come back and chat about that in the next section. Perfect. <laughs>